everybody. Today, we are happy to have two uh, very great speakers, and we will hear two, two, two ex exciting talks from these speakers. So first, we will hear from Peter Edmonds, who will tell us uh, about publicizing your astronomy, motivation, newsworthiness, and practical tips. Second, we will hear from Robin Barnard, and he will tell us about an extended corona in the black hole of a binary in IC10. Uh, and he will also tell us about the implication for UL access. So, Peter, please. So I'm talking about publicizing astronomy, and my experience, as many of you know, has been in publicizing Chandra astronomy over like, the last 12 years. Um, but most, many of my comments are sort of more general about uh, publicizing astronomy. So here's a, just a, a brief outline of what I'll talk about uh, today. I'll talk a little bit about what our group does. Um, then I'll talk about why publicity is valuable. I'll, I'll just sort of assert that and then uh, explain why. Um, I'll talk a bit about what makes up a newsworthy result. Why is it, you know, why is it worth publicizing a result? And then I'll give a few tips um, on how you as astronomers can help out with publicity. So here's the uh, Chandra Education and Public and Communications uh, group. It used to be called Chandra Education and Public Outreach. The name has changed, but the people are mostly the same. Um, I mean, this I could talk in detail about the people um, on this. I mean, it's just oozing in talent. There's there's uh, you know, a lot of experience, a lot of uh, you know, achievements and accomplishment by people in this group doing various things, working on images. You know, Joe does a terrific job with that. Um, Kim is a, is a great graphic designer and web, web designer. Megan is a great writer. Wallace gives great uh, advice about releases. Mel does great illustrations. So I want to also give, um, you know, I could talk about this for a while, but I want to get on to the other stuff. Um, I want to give special thanks to Harvey and also Belinda as directors for the support that they've given to doing um, publicity. And also to people at Marshall Space Flight Center and also NASA for the support they've given. So. I've got a, um, in terms of what we do, I've got a, a brief explanation here, list of the uh, so, sorts of main releases that we do. Um, so we do a sort of lowest level image releases where it's an image, obviously, and a, a detailed caption. And then at a somewhat higher level, we do a press release where it's you know, more, more science. We have quotes from the authors. <coughs> um, then we have two levels of NASA press conference. We have a media telecon, which is a phone-in press conference. And then we have um, an, a TV press conference. And we've done you know, releases at all these different levels over the years. So all of these include an image, and sometimes they include an illustration. Um, and we, for press releases, we invite blog posts from the first author, usually, to uh, give more details about the science. Um, just in terms of the, the standards that we have for the paper that we do publicity on, we require it to be peer-reviewed and accepted. That's a NASA requirement. I think it's a smart one. Um, you know, peer review is not perfect, but it is a filter that you can go, go through. It's an, a check of the result. And uh, for releases, we have the authors do the review. We have people at CXC, including Harvey and Belinda, um, and also people at Marshall do a review, and also NASA headquarters. So we, in fact, have many more reviewers of the press release than there are, there are of the, the paper. Um, and that's whether it's a science or a nature paper, where there are more reviewers. So that's, that's something to boast about, I guess. So I'll just briefly talk about the challenges of doing a good press release. It's actually surprisingly, deceptively challenging to do one, because you're trying to be accurate, you're trying to be concise, you're trying to be interesting all at the same time, and also unambiguous. Now, it's easy to be accurate, but not interesting. You could say that's what science papers are like. Um, you could say it, it, you could certainly be interesting at the expense of being accurate, and that's what exaggeration is or you know, hyping is, is all about. Um, so it's hard to be all of those things at once. And just in terms of being unambiguous, here's an example. This is not from a release, but just from a, a statement on our website that is an ambiguous statement um, that somebody pointed out to us in some sort of a review. It's, it's tri so, it's, so it's good to have independent review because you can miss things like this. So I contrast those priorities for a press release with those for a science paper where you can argue that accuracy is the thing that's really emphasized and then other things like being concise and interesting are sort of at, at lower level. You can, it's, it's easier to be unambiguous because you can use a lot of jargon. So I'll talk just for a little while about why publicity is valuable. 
So I'm starting off here with a couple of reasons that are sort of selfish reasons. Um, so one is that it can enhance your name recognition. If you get you know, a release that gets um, widely publicized, publicized around the country, then you know, it can spread your name around a lot. And then other astronomers, for example, can see it. And they could be potential employers. They might be potential supporters of in a time assignment committee, for example. So that's important. Um, it, it may also increase the numbers of citations for the science paper. Um, and that's, that's actually a tricky thing to, to prove, but there's some evidence for it. So that led me, in preparing for this talk, to think um, about how our most successful uh, stories have done in terms of press coverage, how they've done in terms of science impact, how many citations have they received. So this is a list here of the eight, what I think are the most successful um, press releases that we've done. They're all press conferences. And so I could ask you to, I think there's enough information here to, to, to see what the result was about. You can scan down the list and I can ask people to volunteer which was the most cited of these um, papers. Any guesses? So the Buller Cluster. Yeah, the Buller Cluster was the most, most cited. Um, so I've done just a list here of the numbers of citations here on the right. And then the, the ranking within that journal issue for the, the, the paper was in, in terms of number of citations. So the Bull Cluster got 691 citations. It was the, the most highly ranked paper in the issue in which it was published. So you can see, you know, I'd like to, so you can see cosmology did really well. There's the Bull Cluster with dark matter, then there's two dark energy results right at the top. And I'd like to think that um, at least some of those citations came from people seeing our press coverage. You know, I can't really prove that. All I'd have to do is to get in a time machine, go back in time, not do releases for these um, papers, and then see what citations they get. That's obviously a, a challenge. But if all of these were 2009 and earlier, that, that's five, six years ago. Uh, correct. Is there nothing interesting in the last Yeah, that, that's the, the... I think you're more interesting now than ever before. Yeah, yeah, that's the, we haven't done a press conference since 2012. And that one was, didn't get as, as good press coverage. Um, we did one in 2011, that one didn't get as good press coverage. So there has been a fall off in the number of great, you know, high level results. Um, and, and I consider since 2012, the only result that I was tempted to do a press conference for was the Ezra Bulbul result the, on the possible line. And since then, there's been you know, a lot of controversy about that result. So I would, I would say that that was maybe a, a good move that we didn't do a press conference for that. But there has been a fall off in the really strong results. Peter, those citations are citations in the literature or uh, use in, in the popular media? So the, 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 these are citations by people in lit literature. So it's from the ADS. So yeah. if we wrote a paper and did a press release on it in 2013, it doesn't have time to have lots of citations. Sure, yeah. And that's part of the reason I did the, the ranking, is that, is that then it's, it's, it's comparing it just to other papers. Um, so, um, yeah, so you can see... One thing, there's actually a broad range in the numbers of citations. Um, so I think that, I mean, one conclusion we can make is that, um, you know, even though a story might get very extensive press coverage, it doesn't necessarily lead to lots of uh, citations. And then there's one other comment I'd like to make, and that is that two of the, the best results in terms of press coverage, and ones that also got good citations, were the Bullet Cluster and then the 2006 GUI, the brightest supernova, they were both um, papers that were rejected by nature. That's just, uh, <laughs> just an observation. So I, I'm just going to go through and list a few other reasons why um, publicity is valuable. One is you can become an expert. Um, the reporters use in future, if you're you know, used for a particular release, they may think, oh, so-and-so is an expert on AGN, and then go back and use you to give independent comments on a result. Um, another thing is that Good publicity can spread news about successes and unanswered questions in a particular field, and that's especially important for a field um, that's fairly obscure, perhaps, or a fairly new field. So it's, it's useful for you know, other experts, other astronomers, to hear about it. Another thing is that um, good publicity can generate attractive graphics for talks and papers. Um, you know, I see all the time, I see um, our images and especially our illustrations come up in talks. Um, so it's a, it's a valuable resource for astronomers to use the material that we produce. In, in, in effect, it's a, um, yeah, it's a public service that we do. Uh, 
Another thing is that good publicity can attract and inspire stu students. So one, one anecdote is that there was an astronomer as a student who was inspired by the bull cluster publicity and decided to go into the field of studying colliding galaxy clusters. So that's a very specific you know, um, success story. I'm sure there are others, other anecdotes as well. So sometimes uh, publicity can give a glimpse of scientific method in action with all its sort of you know, messiness. And uh, you know, for example, there's the competition between different groups can be important. That was the case with the um, discovery of accelerated expansion of the universe, the dark energy. And another is in dealing with uncertainty and mistakes. You know, the Bicep 2 um, story is a good example of that, where they gave a very a bullying press conference in this room, and then they had to, and doubt started to appear, and they had to be more circumspect. <coughs> so there's one other um, uh, advantage that I've got listed here, informing the taxpaying public about their investment. So just for a little bit of perspective, I've got um, a listing here from a survey done by Pew Research Center um, about the public's policy priorities for 2015. And you can see there are a lot of very important things. This is just to give some sort of perspective. You can see there are a whole lot of important things um, that are above scientific research, which is down sort of near the bottom, just above global warming. And one, one, I mean, you get, a lot of these things are important, but moral breakdown, you know, moral breakdown is sort of, sort of an interesting one. And then there's also in the same, um, you, know, you can look, at, you look online to see the, the details of this. There's also a big difference, partisan differences in support for scientific research. You can see Republicans compared to Democrats for supporting scientific research. There's a fairly big difference. This is just to give perspective about, uh, you know, there, are other, there might be other groups that don't consider scientific research as highly as we do. And there's one other, one other example, there's one other um, factor I think that's important, and that is to sort of think about if you're not a public figure, you know, if you're not a famous politician, if you're not you know, a, an elite athlete, you know, how would you get national or international coverage for something you do other than committing some terrible crime? <laughs> and, uh, and that's by doing, doing good publicity. So I conclude publicity is valuable. So, so I'll talk um, just for a few minutes about what is a newsworthy result. This is an important issue. I can say that it's simply um, a result that attracts attention from writers and the public, potentially. I mean, it's a, in, before you do the publicity, it's a guess about what will do well. Um, so it's a result that's interesting, it can be interesting in, in several ways. It can have a superlative, it can be novel, controversial, surprising, it can have a beautiful image. All of those things make a result um, newsworthy. It can also be a result that's very important, or at least seem important. Um, and so that's uh, something that might gather a lot of citations or be talked about by other astronomers um, quite a bit. So that, those are sort of vague comments, though. That I've got a list of uh, detailed criteria for newsworthiness here. <laughs> so this is from Lars Lindbergh Christensen, um, who's very thorough. And this, this is available on the AAS website, so you don't have to read through it all now. It's obviously a long list. Um, lots of details, uh, but, but I think the, the, the key thing to take from this is that there are many different factors for why a result might be newsworthy. Um, and really, if you only hit one or two of these, you have a potentially a really good result that, that should be put out to the press. So an understanding of newsworthiness may not come naturally to people, it may not come naturally to astronomers who are busy doing research and may not pay that much attention. Um, to what, what does well in the press. And so um, a brief relate Rick Feinberg's experience as the AAS press officer. So you might remember that there used to be a little box you could check for AAS ab abstracts on whether you thought a result was newsworthy or not. And that's, um, I think it's gone away now, and that's because Rick found that this wasn't very useful. Um, he, he said that there were, people would click on results that weren't newsworthy, in his opinion, he's very experienced. And then there are other people who had newsworthy results that wouldn't click on the box. So I found it just wasn't a useful metric for him. So he took the box away. So in terms of our experience, or my experience, um, of the 17 Chandra press conferences that I've been involved with, um, the authors have contacted us in about two-thirds <laughs> of cases to say, here's a result that we think should be publicized. And that's 
that's actually pretty good. Although it's not terrific because um, you know, there are a few very newsworthy results that, that we weren't contacted about that I sort of like went to the archive and said, so, oh, this is a great paper. In fact, the 2006 GY was an example of that. Um, and also, it is sort of um, also an upper limit because there are a number of cases for results where, say it was a big data set, we were in a very early dialogue with uh, astronomers about doing publicity, so I didn't count that. You know, I counted that as them contacting us when maybe they wouldn't have. Um, so it's an upper limit. And, and it's also just for press conferences, so those are the very best, sexiest results. So for press releases and press conferences, I think the number would be somewhat lower. But I think th the point of this is that it's important. there's an important role for press people, and that is not to miss good results. A few other words about um, what makes a newsworthy result. There doesn't have to be a, a great image if the story is really excellent. So there's 2006 GY with four counts. You can see them there in the top left. So that's, those are so... That's a small, such a small number of counts um, that you can sort of name. I think you should name each of them. And because the story went very well, I think we can uh, give this name here. It made page one, actually multiple times. So it was a very successful story. Uh, great, image can, great images can go a long way, though. Um, and these are some examples um, here of images that have done really well. There's the... Uh, uh, Hand of God it wasn't our nickname. It was given to it. P1509 in the top left, Casse, and a number of great results. Some of them are multi-wavelength, but uh, most of them are. Um, like the HST is a sort of a dominant feature in the bottom left. We added some extra colour and some extra um, detail to the story. So to get a, I recommend if you if you're interested, getting a better feel for what's newsworthy, and that one way to do that is to look at our press conferences look at our press releases and see the sort of thing that we do publicise. And another thing you can do is look at Google News um, science section once or a few times a week and see what sort of things are covered there. So I've just got a little screen capture of um, Google News from, I think, last week. You can see, I mean, we're competing with vampire squids with unique reproductive strategy. That was the number one news, news story at, at some stage last week. But, but second is merging black holes and then there's large destruction universe and a Hubble story. So really astronomy does very well. It punches you know, above its weight, I think. Um, but there's one thing to note, if you really dig into these stories, you'll see that much of astronomy news is driven by releases. And there's a, there's a whole discussion you can have about whether that's you know, a, a bad thing or a terrible thing, <laughs> because that means that publicity, you know, publicity is driving um, press coverage maybe more than it should. You don't have as much independent reporting. But that's partly because science sections have got smaller or gone away and there are fewer reporters. Um, in effect, we're doing some of the reporting ourselves. And, uh, you know, we have our own biases, but you could say so do reporters. So, um, yeah, I think that the bottom line is that if, if you know, our group and other groups like Hubble's and ESA's and others stop doing publicity, then there'll be much less coverage of astronomy in, in the news and that would be a bad thing for the field. So I'm just going to talk um, in the last section about tips um, and sort of advice on helping with publicity. So I think the most important one is to write novel, interesting and important papers. So like, question, any questions? <laughs> um, and that's, yeah, it's easier said than done. Um, but... Also important is that if you think you've got a newsworthy paper, you should send it to press people with submission. Um, and that includes nature and science papers. Sometimes authors think you know, they're scared by all the embargo rules that they get from nature and science and they don't share, want to share the papers with anybody. Um, and that's, that's simply wrong. I mean, you can, you can certainly share the papers with us. You can put them on the archive in most cases as well, certainly for nature, you know, usually for science. So it just helps to have more notice about results. Um, you should, yeah, email uh, me and email Megan uh, Watsky, uh, press officer, um, if, you, if you think you have a good channel result. Now, it's, it's perfectly fine for a paper to be on the archive and still do publicity. That's something occasionally I hear people, astronomers, think that, that if it's on the archive, you can't do publicity. Um, in terms of timing, it's generally best between acceptance and publication. And the exception there is for nature and science, where they want to do 
publicity when the paper's published. Um, but otherwise, um, we're sort of free to do it when we want. Um, successful publicity can sometimes be done well after publication. And there's a notable, noticeable, notable example is VV340, which is a Hubble Chandra composite image that we published. We publicised in August 2011, and the paper was published in June 2009. So that was a long, a long gap. It was a survey paper. It wasn't very interesting, really, scientifically. And it must have been just, you know, it was a quiet summer. <laughs> and because uh, it got NBC National News um, with Brian Williams, it's not in the job anymore, um, uh, CNN, uh, you know, a lot of online coverage. It just did incredibly well and surprised all of us. So that was a, a nice little... Uh, a sort of counterexample to the general rule. Um, so I'm going to talk now about sort of second order issues now, sort of lower level um, than the things I've talked about. Uh, so one is that you can consider doing a sketch or an illustration, um, especially if, if you're lacking a good image in your paper. And as an example of that, here's an, an illustration, a sketch that um, Bin Luo did in a paper that we're actually putting a release out on tomorrow. And that was just for, that's very helpful for us because we were able to take an illustration that was on our web page and then just modify it. This is the original, the modified version. It just um, has a few extra features. So that just made it easy for us. But when, when, you, when you have a sketch like that, it, just, it makes it more, makes it more likely that we will do an illustration. Um, another thing is to consider including some interesting features in your paper. So... This is an example of El Gordo. So the, the proper name for the cluster is ACTCLJ0102 minus 4915, which is really pretty boring, right? Um, but they nicknamed it El Gordo, and they put it prominently in the paper. And so that was something that we could talk about in the release. And any skeptical you know, reporter could look at the paper and say, oh, yeah, they call it El Gordo as well. Um, so it's good credibility. Here's just a couple of... Um, examples of titles that I picked out from the archive that I thought were interesting. These aren't Chandra results, but just in the middle one, the disintegrating rocky planet. That's, that's just the interesting word there. And this one down here, it's a little sort of dark, but autopsy of kill and killer is also sort of a cool <coughs> headline. Another point about the El Gordo paper is that they put the superlatives about the cluster right at the top of the abstract. It was very obvious. And again, that's something for a reporter who would go in to re read the paper could see that fairly easily. So that's a, that's a, that's a bonus from them. And getting back to that uh, very successful publicity we did for the 2006 GY, you can see that the title of their paper makes it very obvious um, how this is an exceptional object. Another thing is to consider writing a non-technical summary of your paper. That's something that actually a reasonable number of people do already, which is good. Um, you know, normally I can wade through the jargon in a paper, but it's helpful to have, have it written because it's easy to imagine how it would be done in a release if you have a non-technical summary. Another point is that if, if a result is significant for a reason or for reasons, you should explain it in detail in the paper. What I sometimes look at, I see an abstract, say, on the archive, I read one sentence about the implications, I think that sounds really good, and I look in the discussion section, and it's one sentence in the discussion section, which to me is like, frustrating because I want to see more details than, than just a, a brief thing. Another thing is if, if you think you have a superlative, put it in the paper. If you believe it, put it in the paper, as the El Gordo people did. So be prepared to hear no and don't be discouraged. You know, it's nothing personal in most cases. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, don't be discouraged, you know, because uh, yeah, there's only so many, um, so many releases that we can do each year. There's, I don't know, four or 500 papers, 200 papers per year, and we do something like um, 25 releases, including image and press releases. So that's only, a, you know, it's a few percent that we can publicise. We don't have time to do more. So if you do say yes, um, you should answer our questions promptly and review the text quickly but carefully. That's something that we have... Yeah, we found that astronomers that we work with are, are very good at doing. Just, just the final part of the talk, I want to mention do-it-yourself publicity. There are other things you can do besides going through us, or you can go through us but not with press releases. One is to consider blogging about your work. We welcome guest blog posts at the Chandra blog. You know, I, said, I already told you about having blog posts for the, the authors of papers. 
um, but you can do a blog post at any time. And we can advertise it on social media, and NASA might advertise it. They have several million followers on Twitter, for example. Um, you can look at John, Johnson, John Johnson's blog. He's, he's a, a person, Harvard astronomer here, who blogs. Um, there's Astrobytes, which is actually sort of more technical stuff. But there's several examples. I do some blogging myself. And you can also consider using social media to discuss your work. You know, I'm a big fan of Twitter, and that can, that can have a big reach. Um, and there's a lot of reporters on Twitter, for example. So just here's my summary. I won't go through all of these in detail, but I just wanted to emphasize one more time, write novel, interesting, important papers, so we can get back to doing press conferences like Christine has pointed out. We haven't done one for a while. And, uh, and tell us, or tell your press people, whoever, whichever observatory it is, about potentially newsworthy results um, at submission. And that's it. Yeah, I think I think in terms of if you went by the number of scientists, I think astronomy would be represented more than most other sciences. And I think it's you know that's another actually motivating factor is that is that astrophysics astronomy is really cool. There's there's black holes, there's you know invisible matter, there's expanding universe, there's so many cool exoplanets, there's so many cool things to talk about. So I think we like I said we punch above our above our weight. And uh, if I was in another field, I might be jealous of that, <laughs> but I'm not. <laughs> okay, other question. Yeah. Could you say a few words about the added complication of getting what you and your group might think is a great result through the NASA screen? Yeah, so, yeah, uh, they may be watching. <laughs> um, yeah, so for a press conference, um, the standard is for me to go down, to, or not go down, maybe call in, do a, do a pitch to NASA headquarters, which includes like the head of science there, the head of astronomy and astrophysics, to um, get approval for a press conference. Um, so I haven't done that for a while because I haven't had a result that I think has been worthy. Um, so that's, that's the sort of the main step in terms of getting a press conference. But you also have you know, headquarters approves you know, basically all the things that go through them, now image releases and press releases. And so they do their own editing. They have, if it's a NASA, if NASA decides to do as a press release what we put in, you know, um, you take uh, take a thing as a press release, then um, the newsroom gets at it, and they they can be fairly I'm not savage, it's not the right word, but they can be uh, you know fairly fairly strict. They want things very simple. They want often the release to be fairly short. That's why blog posts are handy because then they, we can get the scientists to give like a giant quote basically in in the blog post and include more science. Sometimes a particular result or a particular target has several papers written on it almost simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So how do you choose um, that uh, topic? Uh, is it dependent upon one particular set of authors approaching you or more? And how do you actually balance out the, all the different results? Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. We don't too often have that. Um, <coughs> yeah, for example, there was one case where we had a couple of... We, Occasionally do publicity for two papers when we hear about another result and they're, they're concurrent, like for the, turned out for CASA, the, the compact object in CASA, the neutron star. Um, there were two groups working together. We don't have it as much as some groups that say do stuff with GRBs, for instance, where there's, there's you know, an object goes off and there's a rush. But we try to include, I mean, we'll try to include multiple um, results if we think they're all, you know, for the same quality. Um, but it can be challenging then to uh, please different groups. Yeah. 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 Um, that, that, that's true. I mean, we, we've certainly had. I mean, I, I, I listed there the eight most successful of the seventeen Chandra press conferences. The, some of the less successful press conferences have got less publicity than the best press releases that we've done. So, you know, in that case, it was something maybe a misfire by us, 
because we're not perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, there've been, there's certainly been a few, and then there, you know, there, there's certainly been some very successful press releases. And that that image release was a was a big surprise because we, I mean, it was there was really no science in the paper, uh, hardly, and uh, but the image was cool, and it was maybe a fluke, but it, it did did really well. Yeah, I, I, I don't really, I mean, I, I don't know how much of a difference there is, and, you know, I haven't worked with NSF, um, so, yeah, I, I, I can't comment. Does anyone here know more about that, about NSF and, and how they do publicity and how much they spend? Well, when, when, when we first installed our first telescope at the South Pole, <coughs> we were at the same time as Hubble, and our program manager from the NSF came to us and said, you know, there are all these publicity things in the newspaper about Hubble, and guys, you know, you, you made one press release and that's it. And I pointed out to him that Hubble had 30 people who did publicity, whereas our entire group was six people who built the instrument, operated it full time, wrote yeah. all the papers and reduced all the data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, at some, I mean, at some stage with uh, SPT, there was a SPT Chandra result, and then, uh, I remember there was some reticence by some of the senior people to do publicity because they thought NASA was going to steal the show or something like that, and that was that was disappointing and, and you know, a mistake basically. Okay, I suggest we do this pitch, and if there is any last question, start off in the Yeah. I'm not sure the needle I mean. I can't allow. Or do I look wrong? Oh, it's just, that's okay, it's just, yeah, it just took a while to warm up. No, oh, it's a slow computer. <laughs> I didn't think it would power that. Oh, now what's it doing? <laughs> Come on. You can do this. Oh, crap. Yay! Right. So they decided to join us. Oh. Right, okay. So today I'm going to be talking about a really fun project for me, which involves um, harking back to some of the work I did right at the start of my PhD in the early 18 years ago. And it actually sort of like helped settle a bet with myself. It actually predicted something to do with the nature of the corona of black hole systems in a conference um, about 10 years ago. But then you had the data very, very recently, uh, for reasons you'll find out soon. And it's all thanks to this guy here, which is IC10X1, which is a really interesting system because it has a wolf rayet star, which is a very high mass star, throws wind absolutely everywhere. But some of this wind is channeled all the way onto um, the black hole over there. I mean, via an accretion disk. And uh, probably have the disk would be more substantial than you'd see there, but it's just like an artist's impression 
from maybe some of the earlier times when it was thought the disk was more tenuous. And it being, because these systems are kind of complicated, and this is some help with experts in modeling winds and their interaction with X-rays, it's Ian Stevens, and also uh, experts in wolf rate systems in particular, which is Simon Clark, and I published this whole paper in AppJ last year. So you get all the interesting, fascinating details there, but I'll just be going through a summary of the results here. So first of all, I'll be talking about why IC10 is so interesting. So it's the brightest star system in extreme brightest star system in IC10, and in some cases actually approaches the regime of the so-called ultra-luminous X-ray sources, which is a particularly sort of a mysterious type of source of X-ray source. We'll go on to it in a minute. And what's really ex what makes it exciting for me is that it's high inclination, so near the edge on. So um, Presswitch et al. in 2007 uh, identified weird intensity dips in the X-ray light curve every 35 hours, which were interpreted as eclipses. And since the um, companion, so purported companion star also showed orbital variations on 35-hour period, it was dyna dynamically confirmed the system was a black hole with for binary. But what interested me most of all about these, um, these, these light curve features is that they strongly resemble the energy-dependent absorption dips observed in galactic neutron star binaries at high inclination. And as I'll go to talk about in a minute, the spectral evolution of these galactic systems reveals really important information about the geometry of the emission regions. So if IC10 eclipses are energy dependent, they can actually tell you information about the, um, corona, the geometry of the corona and other emission regions too. And since IC10X1 is very similar to ULX's, it might give some in insight into some of the, what the ULX's are doing. And uh, ultra-luminous X-ray sources are basically very, very bright X-ray sources that aren't associated with uh, the nucleus of the host galaxy, but they are brighter than what is accepted for like, adding to limited accretion onto stellar mass black holes. And since it's such a vague description, it can include various types of things. They can either be intermediate black holes, such as perhaps the best case was HLX1, or it could have beam emission, or it could be a new super loop, uh, say Paddington, very luminous state, or it could be normal stellar mass black holes with the standard coronary, which is what I'm going for. And any of these could be true for some subset of these systems because it's just such a vague term. So now I'm going on to the background. So this is the tough kind of stuff I was doing all those years ago. So um, our own galaxy has 10 uh, low mass actually binary systems uh, observed. Oh, crap. Uh, probably. <laughs> so I imagine. Oh, hang on. So I observed the high inclination. So these are low mass stars which have evolved to fill their Roche lobe, and they funnel on to the neutron star with a much more substantial accretion disk, and this kind of thing is what I was uh, expecting in the IC10X1. And because they are high, high inclination, they see the X-ray light curve show these periodic um, intensity dips. But because this is photoelectric absorption during material in the outer disk, is actually, um, you can see the harness ratio changes because the low energy photons are preferentially removed. And so if we do simultaneous fitting of the X-ray spectra at different parts of the dip, where the emission is the same but the absorber evolves, this can give you really important information about the, the nature of the emission regions. So what I found was that the, the thermal and non-thermal components, uh, with the thermal being, component being from basically black body emission either from the neutron star surface itself or the boundary between the a neutron star and a disk and a non-thermal component being sort of in, inverse compensation of cool photons on hot electrons in the corona, it was found that, the, that these different emission components were absorbed at different rates, meaning that the regions were ge geometrically distinct. And since they were doing that, it's also true that it's not simply due to a, an absorber of increasing density covering both things, it must be different. So um, the, the model used, proposed, was like a progressive covering of an extended emitter by extended absorber. 
sort of demonstrated here. So you have this kind of a flat plate in the ADC here, and material on the outer disk here, which gradually covers it. And you can see as this progresses, uh, the intensity gradually falls. So you could actually measure the size of the corona from the ingress, ingress of the dip. And this is here an example of spectral fits for a particular X-ray binary from Morley to 1999. You found that as the intensity decreases, the black body um, absorption, is, this is non-dip, so zero there, it's low and then jumps up to as high as it can measure as soon as it reaches 0.5 of the, of the partial covered. So this is, this is the covering fraction from zero to nearly one. And basically, there's no absorption from the black body until it is halfway across and suddenly leapt, whereas the, the kind of non-thermal component was much more smoothly absorbed. So that's a really, good, a really nice demonstration of this kind of principle. And by doing um, calculations uh, on estimations of the corona size based on this ingress time, um, church, by the Church in 2004, found corona radii of about 20,000 to 700,000 kilometers. Uh, and this is correlated very well with the 1 to 3, 30 kV luminosity. And this data is what I'll be revisiting later on where I compare IC10 to these guys. Because what I thought, the thing I predicted was that if these guys, these neutron star binaries, could have extended coronae at the, at the whole, across the whole luminosity range, then black hole binaries could too. And this could, this could mean that uh, the ULX could be basically due to um, stellar, have constate, sorry, could contain stellar mass black holes with these extended flat coronae, and because you can have the, the total luminosity being super Eddington, while the locally sub Eddington. But there wasn't any data suitable for years and years and years, even though proposed quite a while. And all the observations of, well, for a start, there weren't any known black hole binaries observed at high inclination until about 2007. And then observations of those didn't have the ingress time until 2012, where you finally had this observation, 36 hour observation of IC10X1 with X1 Newton. So, what we have here is a background subtracted light curve in black and the background in grey. And this is kind of alarming. And this, and this kind of background, high background in the start does kind of add some uncertainty into the, the ingress light curve. But this is background subtracted versus background, so it doesn't really dominate. It's, it's kind of here and there. But what's really important is that the um, hardness ratio um, clearly isn't constant throughout the, throughout the dip. And it's, and, it's basically, and it's energy dependent and it's greater than five sigma level. So this means you can do the same kind of tricks with the absor absorber as you could with the neutron star systems. Uh, so what we did was got um, non-dip spectrum from here and a dip spectrum from here. Uh, with and obtain 1950 and 1150 um, net source count respectively, and fitted a whole bunch of models, which had gone into fantastically gruesome detail in the paper. But I'll just talk about the best one here. So, unsurprisingly, the best fit um, was attained for having a point like this black body component and a partially covered um, comet sized component. So, this is the these black figures, show, solid lines, show that the um, full sort of disk spectrum, well, the unabsorbed spectrum and absorbed spectrum. And the dotted line shows the, um, the black body component in the unabsorbed spectrum, but it's completely gone because it's absorbed in the, in the dip spectrum. So all this feature here is actually due to the uh, partial covering of the... Uh, composite component, and so it's about 80%, 85% is is covered. And this is the best. This is the best um, model for several reasons. Um, and if if you compare ones where the absorber is different compared with the one with the absorber for the two components is the same, the one with different beats it at a greater than six sigma level. So. 
it's, re it's a really strong suggestion that the corona is extended. And if the absorption comes from the outer disk, as it does for the, the, the lamas actually binaries, then the corona is about 10 to 6 kilometers, or 10 to 11 centimeters if you prefer CGS, which is about 10% of the disk, disk. And this shows luminosity versus the corona radius for the five, for five um, neutron storm binaries, some of which have observed multiple times. And then this guy here is IC10X1. So it's really, really nicely um, related to these guys if it comes from the disk. But one of the main differences between IC10X1 and low mass X-ray binaries is, of course, that this IC10X1 has a wolf ray at, um, donor star, uh, and there could be vast amounts absorbed from the wind itself. And if the absorption came from the wind close to the star rather than from the disk, then the, um, then the corona size would be a bit bigger because it would have to be, I mean, geometrically, it would have to be projected a bit further away. So, so it could be, let's say, as far as I'm aware, this is the first measurement of a, of a corona in a black hole binary system, and it's at least 10 to 6 kilometers. But some people worry, worry whether such a model is physical because fitting with a two component spectrum of a, um, the, the non thermal and the thermal bits um, naturally leads to the non thermal component dominating over thermal components at high energies. And some people are so concerned about this that Steiner and Child in 2009 created a convolution model to describe constellation called Simple. So it, so in that case, the, um, the non-thermal component could not physically um, it be, be larger than the thermal component because it is modelled in. And, for, and most, of the stuff, most of the black hole binaries in, in, studied in detail in our galaxy were studied with XTE satellite, which has a low energy limit of about 2.5 keV. So the different, any differences between this model and this model would not be seen. But XMM has a much lower energy band. And when I studied UL actors in NGC253 and also IC10X1, I found that the two-component emission model was preferred in all cases, and the simple models actually rejected for two of the spectra, which is including IC10X1. So it does suggest that this soft excess is actually real. And this is completely consistent with the kind of flat co co coplanar um, corona that both feeds on and simulates production of soft photons in the outer disk, as described by Hart and Rashi in 1993. So it's a radically ra different picture of a corona than, it, than the typical spherical corona, which a lot of people assume. So, um, so how does this play to ULXs? Well, well since isotonics 1 is already a, a highly luminous extra binary um, with extended corona, it could be fairly similar to it's your Alexis. I mean, the 0.3 to 10 keV luminosity could reach around 10 to 39. And so the broader band luminosity could be much higher. And since these kind of flat extended coronae allows globally super Eddington luminosities while remaining sub locally sub Eddington, uh, the, the ULXs could be, many of the ULXs could be something like this. Um, for example, I mean, Gladstone et al. in 2009 so, so surveyed a whole bunch of ULXs, and in fact, they selected the brightest, highest quality spectra of ULXs, and they found that this soft excess was a universal feature. And this is shown, this is example, this is shown here. This is an extreme example, where you have the thermal component here, and the non-thermal component dominating over the entire energy range. And they said, There's, there must be another component. Um, and this is a rather extreme example. But this table here shows spectral fits of black body plus this, this black body plus power law fits to the ULXs. And a lot of these guys have very reasonable temperatures and uh, photon indices. Uh, so temperatures around about 1, photon index around 2.4, 2.5-ish. And these are perfectly consistent with canonical black holes in like, something like this, the very high state. And these guys could, be, could very well be just um, stellar mass black holes with, um, yeah, with extended coronae. But there are other guys with like, temperatures about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.10, 0 0.11, 0 0.12, 0 0.
0.3, something like that. And these could either be uh, um, very massive black holes, or they could be in the ultra-luminous state uh, proposed by Gladstone et al. 2009, where the corona is so, so um, dense that you don't see the end disk. And these kind of so the actual true disk temperature is actually high on these guys. So it could be a mix, but it looks like at least some of these guys could just be uh, what I proposed. So, so, so the main points are these. I mean, the intensity dips observed in X-ray light curves of ISO 10X1 are caused by photoelectric absorption rather than uh, energy independent absorption from the from the from the wolf ray itself directly. And it affects each component differently. Uh, that's allowed us to measure the, the corona to be more than ten, at least 10 to the 6 kilometers. And it is a, if, you, if it's um, associated with a disk, then it's entirely consistent with the, the 10 or so neutron star binaries, which are high inclination, which show this kind of, well, for, it's with the, for which the corona are measured. And this is probably the first measurement of corona in a black hole binary. And um, didn't you have a co uh, co corona which is suggested by, the, by our models allows the soft excess seen in the ULXs um, to be basically just due to this extended corona. And so many of these ULXs could simply be stellar mass black holes with extended corona, so the luminosity is globally C Reddington but locally sub Reddington. And that's your lot. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's, there's been a strong link between ULXs and high mass, um, I mean, sorry, sorry, high star formation rate galaxies. And um, I've talked to other people who are more theor theoretical, and they're talking about how many star systems go through a, a, page, a stage of thermal time scale mass transfer, which is a very, very high accretion rate. So they could be, so it could just be that they go through a phase during their young lives of really, really high accretion. And because it's, because it's not blown out by a spherical corona, it can actually maintain that. Possibly. Short -lived in their yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because well, if, if these guys are mostly high mass spectral binaries, they're going to be short -lived, lived, and that phase will be particularly short lived, I think. No, no, no. It's just that, um, well, for example, there's, there's a galactic neutron star binary, which I studied, called Scorpius X1, which is very well known. Um, and in some observations, its luminosity, in XG observations, the luminosity goes up to 10 to the 39 x per second. But the neutron star itself is sub-Eddington. The, and because the corona is, is kind of flat, extended, if it's kind of flat, then it doesn't have to be... It can be locally sub Eddington, but every, it's combined total, total luminosity of everything can be super Eddington because it's over, it's over a wide area. So it's not, it's not defeating the Eddington limit. Does that make sense? But if it's like a, a big absorb, if it's a big non spherical emitter, it, do, it doesn't matter about the Eddington limit. You can, you can um, emit luminosity up to a factor of 10 or so more because no one place is super Eddington for that particular region, but the whole total is.